Holy City Center Radio, this is episode 117, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. Quite the day for me on Wednesday. Uh, thankfully, a uh, scary moment turned out I wasn't in s- as much danger of it may have, se- it may have seemed at first. Um, so let's get into that right away. Uh, it's also a-, a story here that I would have covered anyway. Uh, but Police um, have, were investigating shots fired at a parking garage in downtown Charleston at the Medical University of South Carolina. This took place on Tuesday. Uh, I happened to be in this garage when it occurred. I was talking on the phone with someone, and I was, for those who aren't familiar, uh, there is a garage. It's named, it's named the McLennan Banks Garage. It's in between the Ashley River Tower which is on Courtney Drive, um, and the new Sean Jenkins Children's Hospital, which is on the same road, but its address is different. That's neither here nor there. Uh, But the garage faces basically the back of the Ashley River Tower building and what's essentially the front of the Sean Jenkins Children's Hospital. Again, if you've been down there, that makes sense. Uh, But in any event, I was in the walkway leading towards the Ashley River Tower. I was kind of, since I was on the phone, I didn't want to go in and disturb anybody. So I was walking in between that walkway and then there's kind of like a platform that, you know, that is the garage itself and you make your way in there. So I'm in the garage, not quite on the walkway. And I hear, I don't know, five to eight, maybe just boom, 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 you know, really pretty quick and super loud. I'm sure it's loud anyway, but in the garage, it was just echoing and it was so loud. Between being on the phone and being shocked, I wasn't quite sure what it was. I was like, those weren't gunshots, were they? And I was just, you know, I was like, no, this can't be. I don't know why I would doubt it, considering this happens everywhere all the time. And then about, you know, 15 to 20 seconds later, I hear another series of, you know, five to eight shots. Same thing, super loud. And at this point, I'm a little bit more worried. I don't know what else that noise could be. And then I started to see a couple of people running in they're in the garage and they're running. And so that's when I thought to myself, Oh my God, this is actually happening. Like there is a shooter and I'm in this garage somewhere and I'm in this garage with them. And so needless to say, I took my, I was not going back deeper into the garage, of course. So I, you know, went pretty quickly down the walkway and then around the corner. So I'm in, now I'm in the Ashley river tower building at MUSC and I'm kind of looking out towards the garage, you know, I'm behind glass and a wall and I'm not, you know, too concerned at this point, but I'm looking just to see if I can see anything after seeing those people in the garage running. I didn't see anybody like running away, you know, coming into the building. I didn't see any activity outside the building now I'm really confused. Like, all right, was it just something random and we all just panicked? Because, again, it's this country and there's been shootings all the time everywhere, or at least it feels that way. Uh, but uh, long story short, on my end, you know, uh, MUSC started providing updates. They never locked down the building I was in. I heard, but I, I couldn't confirm that the children's hospital was shut down for a little bit. Uh, I'm guessing because their main entrance faces the garage. And it turns out these shots were fired on the first, you know, the ground floor, basically, you know, street level. And so that would make sense. You know, they would be locked down since they have like an actual entrance there. Uh, So, uh, you know, in the end, uh, public, the MUSC public safety department, you know, kind of like they're on campus police, for lack of a better term, responded as well as Charleston, the actual Charleston police department. And they never found the shooter. They didn't find any victims. It appears no one was hurt or killed. So thank goodness for that. But that's really all they said. And then a little bit later in the afternoon, um, I think the shooting happened, you know, shots were fired around 11 something in the morning, maybe. Um, Yeah, I think it was a little after 11 a.m. And uh, by, I think, 2 p.m., they had cleared the scene and said they gave the all clear. So even though there's the all clear, nobody was arrested, at least as, as of this recording. There was no real updates as to who or what this person was shooting at. You know, was, was there some, were they trying to hit someone? Were, were they, 
like mad, frustrated, and shooting at the wall. Like wh- no idea, no updates. As I said, as of this recording, but uh, you know, look, I'm not trying to make a bigger deal out of this than it is. I know people, friends who have been in actual mass shootings, thankfully survived. Uh, and can't imagine that that terror and going through something like that. This is nothing like that. After you know those few moments of terror and thinking to myself, oh my God, this is happening. There's a shooting in a building that I'm in. I mean, a garage, but you get it. Uh, after you know, seeing there wasn't really any panic, seeing that the way the police responded to it and the lockdowns, it was only a little bit of me being like, okay, looking around the building, like, how do I get out of here? What's the best way, you know, and being scared, but it was, it was short lived. And I, I, you know, truly never felt super in danger, you know, just those few moments in the garage itself, when I realized other people were running, that was the only time I was really scared. So I can't even imagine if I was in actual danger, you know, it turns out from what I know so far, like I said, no one's injured. Uh, so it appears this person was on the first floor of the garage. I was basically a floor above. So I wasn't, ex- I wasn't like near them. Um, and I, and that was still frightening. So I can't even imagine seeing a shooter being shot, being, you know, being involved in that manner. Uh, but it's just a reminder that even though this appears an MUSC is saying it's an isolated incident, whatever that means as far as why this person was shooting and what they were shooting at or who, it appears there was no danger to the, the campus at MUSC or anybody around it at large. This wasn't like a mass shooter type situation. That's all we really know. Um, but it's just a reminder that there's guns everywhere and you just never know when someone is going to be firing it, whether it's a mass shooting or some kind of dispute between, you know, a couple parties or whatever. Um, but you just never know what's going to happen and it just doesn't seem to stop. Uh, but though, so that was, uh, what I was, uh, what I experienced on Tuesday. Like I said, not trying to make a big deal out of it. I don't need any, you know, hope you're okay. I'm fine. It was just a few, you know, a few moments of, of fright hearing that. And it was just so loud too. Um, and just grateful that, whatever this person's intent was, it appears so far uh, that they did not harm anyone else, uh, which is the most important thing. So yes, that was my experience today. And uh, like I said, I would have shared this story anyway, but wanted to give my perspective uh, since I was in the area. Uh, But enough about that situation and me, let's move on. We've got some other stories to talk about. Next up, sadly, um, just not a great story. And, and unless you just have been, you know, avoiding the news and I don't blame you, uh, it's hard to miss this story out of Folly Beach, uh, this horrific accident where a woman in a car uh, who ended up being arrested for uh, D- on DUI charges uh, hit a golf cart on Folly Beach. Apparently the golf cart, according to one of the victim's uh, mothers, uh, went over a hundred feet, like flew, rolled, and multiple people were injured pretty badly. In fact, uh, uh, as of this recording, some are still in the hospital. And even more tragically, one person was killed. That was a uh, a woman who was just hours away from being married, uh, which just makes this even more devastating. So. Um, you know, there's no good side to this, but donations have been pouring in as news spreads. And I've seen this covered nationally. Um, one of my family members told me they saw it on their local news in the Northeast. So everybody is, is in the country has a potential to see this story on their news or, or nationally. But yes, donations are, are coming in to a GoFundMe account after news has started spreading about this crash that killed a woman and severely injured her husband and two others just hours after their wedding on Folly Beach. The crash happened on Friday at approximately 10 p.m. when they when they were in a golf cart and they were rear-ended by a vehicle. It took place in the 1200 block of East Ashley, East Ashley Avenue. Uh, the person who was killed in the crash, her name is Samantha Miller. She had just gotten married earlier in the evening. Uh, the other occupants of the golf cart uh, were taking to the newlywed couple back to their rental home 
uh, when they were struck. So the GoFundMe page was set up by the uh, husband, mother, and it had a listed goal of $100,000 that was going to go towards helping pay for Samantha's burial and then medical costs for her, who just became her husband, Eric Hutchinson, and then his family members who were also in the golf cart. So that $100,000 uh, fundraising total has been blown by. No surprise, this, this story is resonating with people. As of this recording, they are just shy of $500,000, which is incredible that so many people are reaching out, wish they didn't have to, of course, but it, it is pretty incredible that so many people around the country are donating and, and trying to help these folks out. The uh, driver of the vehicle that struck the golf cart was arrested uh, and identified po by police as Jamie Komoroski. Uh, they said that she was traveling at a speed of 65 miles per hour when it struck the golf cart. If I'm not mistaken, uh, all of Folly, if not the vast majority, is about 25 miles per hour. So well over that. Not to mention they've determined she was under the influence in, in some capacity. Um, she face, faces three counts of DUI causing seriously serious bodily injury or death, and one count of reckless homicide. Um, as of the recording, as I mentioned, two of the occupants of the golf cart remained in serious condition, and the third, uh, a child, uh, is thankfully in stable condition, so, so doing better than the others, uh, and hopefully they all pull through it. Uh, very sad story. I'll be sure to give you any updates as they come across. A link in the show notes will bring you to a story, which will also bring you to the GoFundMe page if you would like to donate. The South Carolina Democratic Party has some new leadership. Crystal Spain, a longtime party operative, was elected on Saturday as chair of North Carolina's Democratic Party. She becomes the first black woman to lead the organization in what will be a, a pretty exciting time for them uh, as the Democrats lead, uh, lead off presidential voting state is now South Carolina. They are now first in the nation uh, for primary voting, and that will take place in 2024. Spain was elected during the party's convention on Saturday in Colombia. Uh, she takes over, um, as I mentioned, at a time of a lot of change for the Democratic parties in 2024. Uh, with her election, and, and thanks to the party's recent revamp of its primary schedule, four of the five states in which Democrats will vote first next year, that's Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, and South Carolina, now have black women chairing their state parties. Uh, Spain called their victory a historic moment for our party for women and pledged to implement year-round voter engagement and mobilization efforts in hopes of garnering, garnering more statewide wins for the party. So we'll see um, if she can make changes for the Democratic Party here in the state, regardless a historic moment uh, as she takes over the lead of the party. The historic Mother Emanuel AME Church is currently undergoing a $2.7 million renovation. Uh, you may have seen it covered in scaffolding uh, recently as work has uh, continued. Uh, you know, they've been doing work on the church for several years now. Uh, but they, yeah, as I mentioned, it's now at the forefront, as you can see, that scaffolding uh, right out front. That $2.7 million price tag as I mentioned, obviously going towards renovations, it's going to cover both the inside and outside of the building, uh, you know, just trying to stabilize some things as, as well as, you know, just making sure it is secure, um, you know, from a structural standpoint and making these renovations. The pastor of the Mother Emanuel AME Church, Eric Manning, has said that, uh, you know, they want to make just a few changes, as few as possible, since it is a, such a historic church, they're not trying to you know, completely and vastly change it. Just some small changes just to make sure that, you know, um, they're taking care of the building itself. He said the project originally started out of necessity after termites caused significant damage to some of the building structure. And as they were going through, they found some other things that they wanted to fix, like including reinforcing a few of the trusses inside the church and the balcony that holds the organ. He said that, uh, Rev he meaning, um, Pastor Manning, said the organ was so heavy that it actually caused part of the balcony's structure to fail. So definitely something they needed to get done as soon as possible. Uh, Manning said phase one of the restoration project will likely wrap up at the end of this June. He said phase two of the project will likely begin in about a year and a half. Jumping back to politics briefly, Mac DeFord, a Citadel graduate and attorney who spent years in the Coast Guard, uh, has entered the 2024 race for South Carolina's first congressional district. 
DeFord, who lives in Mount Pleasant, shared his plans with the Post and Courier this uh, week. He uh, planned on making the campaign announcement official on Tuesday, uh, and he will be the Democrats' first run for—I'm sorry, it'll be his first run for political office. He's actually the second Democrat to announce that they will be running against incumbent Nancy Mace. Uh, The other person who announced was Michael B. Moore. He made his announcement last month, becoming the first challenger to announce that he was running against Mace. On the Republican side, uh, Mace so far has has gotten one challenger, Austin Anderson of St. Helena Island. So depending on how that all goes, you know, assuming they don't drop out, there will be a primary vote. Uh, Mace will have to uh, defeat the Austin Anderson first. And then whoever ends up on the Democratic side winning is who she would then, of course, go uh, head to head with in the uh, statewide election. Regardless of how many people jump into the race or how this all shakes out, they are all, of course, seeking to represent uh, this District 1 here in South Carolina. It's predominantly, you know, covers Charleston, but other areas as well. And at the moment, you may remember, it's in the center of an ongoing legal challenge. Uh, The state's Republican lawmakers have asked the U.S. Supreme Court to review a federal court ruling that concluded that the district's political boundaries had been unconstitutionally drawn to dilute black voting power for partisan gain. That's what was determined. Republican lawmakers, as I said, are asking for a review. So we'll see how how that all works out. Regardless, uh, you know, they're all going to have to have the right message to, to go ahead and, you know, for the Democrats to try to take back a seat that they held with Joe Cunningham and for the Republicans to maintain it for a third straight election cycle. And lastly, sad to share that the South Carolina Stingrays uh, season ended on Monday night. Uh, They had an amazing regular season, but they just couldn't get past the Florida Everblades Uh, in game six at the North Charleston Coliseum on Monday night. They were defeated two to one. And that ends the series. They lost four games to two, and unfortunately that ends their season as well. Uh, The game winner came at the 9.55 mark of the overtime period, so making it even tougher, you know, losing in overtime, uh, just so tough. And uh, unfortunately, a really good season for the Stingrays ends much earlier than they would have liked, uh, but can't. You know, you can't be too upset. Uh, I'm sure players are and wanted more, but they, they had a really good season making the Kelly Cup playoffs again, which seems to be a annual thing for this team, at least in recent history. And hopefully they'll bounce back next year. That'll do it for this episode. I hope you all are having a great week. I will talk to you again on Friday. Stay safe out there. If you have a chance, please rate and review this podcast. Uh, anything else you can do on streaming platforms, you know, whether it's sharing it um, or subscribing, anything will help, uh, get this podcast in other people's ears. You can also go to holycitycenter.com slash shop to pick up some merchandise and go to patreon.com slash holycitycenter to find other ways to support the podcast, the website, and everything else. Thank you to Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System, who produced this and every episode of Holy City Center Radio, and Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in each and every episode. Looking forward to talking to you on Friday. Until then, good night and good luck.